Hey guys, this is Philip from Irish Medieval History. This week, myself, Denton and Michael had an old chat on clans and dynasties on Facebook. Afterwards, we uploaded the video over to Irish Medieval History. If you haven't liked the page on clans and dynasties, definitely do so. And also head over to my own page at Irish Medieval History and have an old check of that as well. Anyway, we've decided to upload the video over to Denton's page as well, so definitely enjoy. Anyway, all the best. Welcome to Irish Medieval History. Uh, today we are live on Facebook. We were originally attending to be live on YouTube, but because of the continuous technical problems that is YouTube, uh, we've moved over to Facebook, which is a little bit more dry and cut. Uh, you, you click on live and you expect to be live. Simple, simple. Mm. And mm. so here we're on Facebook today with Denton and Michael, and we're going to have a wee chat on the Vikings. Um, so any questions you guys have, make sure to post it up on the old chat there. It's going a bit slow. I think it's like a minute slow all the way to 10 minutes slow. So <laughs> if you don't find your question, it's 10 minutes late. Facebook is to blame for that. No, it's it's only um, about ten seconds delay, and I can see all the comments. So, uh, you know, don't worry. Like, just you'll see a the, it's about a, a ten fifteen second sure. delay between sort of when we get it and and we'll pass it across to you. So, um, just uh, yeah, plenty of people coming on now here, and uh, you know, just even just put a like, put a share, um, ask a question, say hello. Um, we'll all just try and get the interactions because I'll be here typing away and keeping an eye on it so um yeah it's great to have you on board all of you so far and uh yes. and it's great to have denton on as well on this makeshift i feel like you know we promised uh we promised uh, a, a big marquee and you have come and found one of those rundown tents from a, a download festival or something <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> <laughs> but we'll, we'll make it work we'll make it work you know I improv we will. improvise, we, we adapt, will. and overcome. That's for uh, that's for yeah, one of the boys right. who's watching. <laughs> right. So let's well, get back into it. Um, so we, we're going to start again, sort of thing, are we? Um, yeah. We, we, we don't know how much um, of that is, went out. Yeah. Um, how did the Viking Age start, and what is a Viking? Is what we were basically starting the conversation with. Yes. Because, you know, yes. That's an easy yeah. topic to uh, get into. What that is an easy. That is a very easy topic because, um, as I said, so often the Vikings weren't Vikings because uh, people have this idea, you know, when you see so many comments, the Vikings, it's like they were one group of people from one place, they were all together, they had one leader, you know, and I mean, to begin with, of course, they weren't uh, all one group of people, they were from uh, Denmark, uh, Norway, Sweden, and Frisia. Um, they had no unified leaders. Um, they, they fought among each other just as much as they did the fight with the Irish or, or the Saxons. <clears throat> and um, even the, the terminology, because I mean, Viking or Viking, as it is in Old Norse, literally means um, an adventurer, a seafarer, you could say a pirate, someone who goes somewhere, but it is linked to a ship. Because you could basically say it's a seafarer. Um, so, you know, if, if you turned up at uh, Lindus Farina in 793 or you arrived off the coast of Ireland in 795 in a ship and you jump off and you, um, you know, burn a monastery or two, get back in your ship and off you go, you're a Viking. But if you have come and you've founded a settlement like, you know, Waterford or Wexford or, or Diffin, um, and you are now no longer a Viking because you're not in a ship. You're raising crops, having children, blah, blah, blah. So your Vikingness is in the ship. Uh, and I think that's that's quite an interesting point because you know you are only a Viking if what you're doing is related to the ship or even what you're going to do like maybe getting some slaves you're going to take them to the ship and go somewhere well you're Viking but if if say you have settled here or you've been born for example in Dyflin you're raised here you may never have been in a ship well you're not a Viking you're a Norse settler you're a townsperson mm -hmm. um, and even if you are fighting with local Irish tribes you're still not a viking i mean you've got your shield and your sword and all that but you're not a viking because you haven't jumped off a a, a nice ship with a lovely dragon head on it like like those over there and i think that's one interesting uh, thing and the other thing i think that's important about the 
the Vikings, to use that term, uh, in Ireland, is this idea of it was the Vikings, the Irish, them, us, constant fighting. Whereas, you know, I mean, some uh, Norse Jarl would uh, have an alliance with an Irish king to beat the stuffing out of some other Irish king. And then the Irish king would go and help the Norse Jarl to fight some, some uh, Norse people. So there was an awful, like when, when Ivar the, the Bonus uh, left to lead the great heathen army, he had a chat with a couple of Irish chieftains, and he said, well, will you keep an eye on Diffin while I'm away clobbering the Saxons, you know? Yeah. Um, and, you know, you have all this kind of, um, Brian Baru's, uh, what was his half-brother or something, Mahan, um, yes. had, made, um, had made an alliance with the North. So, you know, th there's all these, all these things that people don't sort of realize because they have this, I suppose, stereotypical idea of Vikings were always jumping off ships, they were always burning things, uh, and they completely forget that there was as much trade, settlement, exploration as there was raiding, you know. And uh, also the idea that you know, every, every single Norse person was a Viking, went off raiding. I mean, a huge section of the Norse population across Scandinavia might never have even been in a ship. Because unless you lived near the coast, you probably would never have, have, have been in a ship at all. Um, and the, I, I think the, the, the term Viking is so misused because we hear Viking ships, Viking clothing, Viking blah, blah. Um, like there was no such, there's no such thing as a Viking ship. There's a ship in which some people were going Viking. The ship is a ship, that's it, you know. And there was no Viking music or Viking art. There was Scandinavian, Danish, Swedish music, art, etc. So Viking is a, is a word that is extremely uh, incorrectly used. Because mm -hmm. it does specifically mean a person doing a particular thing. As I said, you drive a you, you drive a truck. Oh well, you're a truck. No, I just drive it. You know, and I think uh, I, I think that's that's something that is frequently over. And even I mean, I've seen documentaries. I've seen uh, things in museums where they refer to everybody as the Viking. Here, yeah. Here's a Viking woman plowing a field or something. No, she's not. She's not in the ship. You know. Um, and I mean, if, if you'd gone back to, to uh, one of the Scandinavian countries, say in the ninth century, and there's a guy there with his plow, if you'd said to him, well, are you, are, are you a Viking? He'd have said, do you see a ship here? No, yeah. you know. Uh, yeah, that's, so that, that's, that's my little if, opening statement if, for me. If you're going through the Gannals, it never says Viking. It never, no. ever turns around and says They never use that term. This is their no. perfection. Because yes. at the time, at the start of um, Vikings moving mm -hmm. into Ireland in around 793. <laughs> they're attacking monasteries, they're burning monasteries, but that's not unusual. You know, it mm -hmm. pops up here and there, but what they really want to highlight at the start of the Viking Age is um, Flamard McRivcon, uh, Flamard um, God, his name's completely anyway, uh, McRivcon anyway who's going around actually doing more damage than the Vikings were at the time. The Vikings were only attacking the main coastal areas. Mm. McCrifcon, on the other hand, in 836, just before 836, he was pushing to become King of Ireland, and mm. he was doing far more damage attacking any monastic settlement that disagreed with him. And he was quite mm. literally rocking up, burning the monastic settlement, and his justification was they weren't holy enough. And... <laughs> In this day and age, that doesn't get enough highlight. It's very much like we get this image that it's Viking versus Irish. But if you actually look at the annals, sit down yourself. The annals are all online. Mm. I'd happily yeah. link, put the link below. I could look it up for you now. Just go on it's, and Google, type in just the type annals in or Celt dot ucc um and that you'll yeah. find you'll get all the annals there basically um, all over there, and you can good. it's all translated and you can read it bit by bit. I do it all the time, and mm. the main thing is MacRivcon. Don't like. At the same time, they are turning around and highlighting the Norman heathens, as they call them, and they're panicking. Mm. It's like, oh, these non-Christian yeah. people are here, but they don't go into detail of why they're really panicking. Um, compared to MacRivcon, MacRivcon is taking some serious violent actions, but mm. it depends which annals you're reading. If you do take it from the annals of Ulster, because they're very pro e nail they're going to be panicking and saying, look, this guy from uh, Munster is coming up here, burning all of our monastic settlements because we disagree with him. And he's very much like, well, you're all heathens to me, and you deserve what you're getting. Um, we don't yeah. talk about my trip on enough. It's always, you 
been on Facebook constantly hearing people saying the Viking invasion. And I'm thinking, yes. what Viking invasion are you talking? Are you talking about the Kingdom of Lucklin up in uh, Scotland coming down in about I think it's about 833, or it was about 820. They go into uh, the Kingdom of Ullid, uh, and the Kingdom of Ullid wipes them out of it. And if if you're talking about that, it's not much of a Viking invasion. It, it don't get me wrong. Something around four thousand troops against four thousand troops. It's a battle, but yeah. it's a very failed invasion. It should be called the Viking failed invasion if you're using <laughs> that as an example, because there is yes. other than that, there is no large army that comes in turn. There are various raids around the coast of the settlement. Where you do see large armies marching around is MacTripcon, who's going around each one of the monastic settlements, uh, even in his own territories down in Cork, where I'm from, and burns the monastic sultan there, the St. Finbars, he then kidnaps the Bishop of Cork, brings him up to Cashel and starves him to death, you know? Lovely, don't give yes. me I'm not undermining what the um, Scandinavians do around the coast of Ireland. Mm. It's violent and it's disturbing. Uh, they kidnap yes. women and mm. they get monastic men, uh, men of the church, they tie him to a stone and they stone him to death. Various violent acts like that. So mm. they're not saints. They're just as violent as evil. Yeah, yes, as the you're. Evil. You know, you're raising you're raising a very good point there because when you look at it, it, like the thing, you look even say at Britain, it, yeah. there is this sort of popular thing that seems to be put forward that the Vikings turned up. Until the Vikings turned up, everything was lovely and peaceful. People went around sniffing flowers and all this kind of thing. I mean, the Saxon England, or um, before the uh, Vikings arrived, they were fighting constantly. The Welsh were raiding, the Scots were coming down over the Hadrian's Wall. All the various um, Saxon kingdoms were fighting each other. And, you know, the, the Vikings were just the last lot to turn up. Yeah. And uh, even the fact of invaders, I mean, once the Romans left, you had Angles, Saxons, Jutes, Frisians. They came in, they drove the actual Celtic people into Wales, into Cornwall. Then the Vikings turn up, but it's only the Vikings who are seen as these invaders. They were simply the last invaders to turn up. Um, and I mean, uh, Saxon Britain and Celtic Ireland, there was constant warfare going on. And as you say, in Ireland, the Irish chiefs were beating the crap out of each other yeah. long before the Vikings ever turned up. And um, that, yes, you, I mean, you, you raise a very good, a good point there. And the, the Vikings fighting Vikings. You know, it's always over. I mean, there was a massive battle in yes. Dundalk Bay in, I think, 850 something between Norwegians and Danes. Mm. You know, or you had the King of Dyfryn went down to Limerick and he burned all the ships of the King of Limerick because they were having a chip. You know, yeah. uh, yeah. you know, people well, overlook that kind of it, you know. No, I mean, it, it goes down to not even just uh, like clan warfare, of, uh, but you have uh, political gangs within those clans. So you would have. Mm. Uh, clans who maybe you mentioned there where uh, Olaf Guthrieson went and uh, attacked Limerick um, mm. just before he his failed invasion uh, for Ambra, um against King Athelstan in England but yeah they, they had I mean we've got the whole argument in Dublin Dyflin obviously with the Fingal and the Dovegal being basically mm. potentially being two political factions at each yeah. other so these things these people were never on every sort of social level and every sort of whether it be clan kingdom or uh, anything like that the uh, they they're all broken down into sub factions and everything like that it's never so black and white and I think it's a mm. it's human nature to paint history black and white you know or sympathy yes. or tribalism all that kind of stuff gets thrown into mm. the mix um, but really, yes, is... yes, that, that, that's very true. You, you get this, you get these ideas, a lot of stereotypical ideas, and they become fact. And this is what you have repeated, even in very good uh, documentaries. Um, well, I mean, look at look at the Round Tower. Mm. I mean, you know, you'll, any number of, of things you see will tell you the Round Towers were built because of Viking raids, so the monks go into them. Now, anybody with any brains, you know, if these people have come hundreds of miles to get treasure. And they know that you and that treasure are in that tower. They're going to get into it. It's not mm. going to protect you at all. If you left the treasure outside and got in the tower, that would make sense. And um, it does appear that the towers really were belfries. Mm. Uh, they were not built specifically because of the Viking raids. Um, some of them wouldn't even give you a view because they say, "Oh, there were men in the top, and they could, you know." 
a lot of them you can't see anything um and uh, even the door 10 feet off the ground uh, some engineer was saying well the, the building is so tall and thin it has very small foundations but the reason the door was further up was if you put it at ground level it would weaken it would weaken the structure and that's why they put it up there mm. and that makes sense because when you think of it okay the door is 10 feet in the air uh, so okay and um, you know um, Sven uh, bring a ladder the next time we come here and then we'll <laughs> climb up to the door you know that wouldn't just stop them all they would do would be make them look around to find a way to get in so I mean there's there's a bit of a, a, a fallacy if you like there that these things were not custom made to keep the to protect the monks from the Vikings they probably ran into them but it's very unlikely they took all the treasure with them because that would have meant the Vikings followed them straight in Fair you know? and um, yeah, you, you get that sort of thing. It's, I think it's quite interesting. Um, just to say on another chat here, me and you need to smile more. That's what the... Uh, <laughs> Who is that? <laughs> 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 it's not mine, is it? No, it's just, it just I, came I to I like me. to take these things very seriously. <laughs> yes, yes, well, we, yes. We don't, I mean, we are, we are here to have a serious debate, not do a, not do a song and dance thing, you know. So oh, we're oh. all together in the choral dance. Uh, that's another five minutes. We, we did discuss about um, Denton putting on the pink dress that I sent on. Which has the package hasn't arrived yet? <laughs> no, it hasn't arrived, darling, and I'm really sh upset because I would have been so good in pink dress, you know. <laughs> you know, but I'm sorry about that. You'll just have to, you'll just have to do without that yeah. wonderful experience. As you would, you would have remembered it forever. As for me, I'm just so concerned that this my computer might explode or something that I'm just put const constantly monitoring everything. On. Well, that that would that would add a certain <laughs> excitement. Uh, <to> <laughs> The way this started off, I wouldn't be tossed by it if it did blow up. I mean, it, let's face it, that's about the only thing that hasn't gone wrong yet, so, you know. Um, <laughs> YouTube. YouTube's the blame for everything. Hey, Philip, <laughs> so going back, just a, a quick thing here from uh, one of the guys watching here. Uh, Luke Manning mm -hmm. says, uh, so basically Vikings were like uh, old school Marines. Is, is, is yeah. that what we're saying? Yeah, I was actually thinking about that the other day. I was actually thinking about making a video. Um, Comparing the evolution of the Gallo glass to um, U.S. Rangers and Vikings to U.S. Marines, and mm. you can actually see the evolution through the years, going from the early medieval period and branching out to um, the skills and drills that they learned on the ground. Now, I'm not talking about like regiments going straight. I'm talking about like the survival skills and drills that they. Mm. Um, early Vikings would have used going on raids, and then the Gallo glass would have used um, when it comes down to the tough terrain that you experience in Ireland. Because when you have uh, people then from the Britain and Ireland who immigrate over to America to fight in the um, American War of Independence, Rogers Rangers appear. Now, don't get me wrong, 90% of what Rogers Rangers use are um, what the indigenous uh, Indian people already had. Uh, mm. However, 10% of those skills actually originated with the gallow glass and what they had learned in the rough terrain um, of Ireland and Scotland. Um, it literally transferred over to uh, Rogers Rangers and there's some of the kit, uh, for instance, uh, the usage of blankets and cloaks that Rogers Rangers would have had as night cover at night time. Uh, which eventually become sleeping bags. Um, mm. That you you can see the evolution of that going all the way back to Vikings. Now U.S. Mm. Yeah. Marines, yeah. Uh, on the other hand, um, I'd, I'd say about two percent, maybe of their skills, two, three percent, four percent, something like that, making that number up right now. Um, those skills, basic skills and drills of their survival techniques. Yeah the Vikings would have used as well and people who came from Britain and Ireland who learned those skills during the early medical period of going from a boat onto the uh, coastal areas to quickly do an assault on a monastic settlement yeah of course those skills would be brought over from the early medieval period evolved through the years up into the uh, modern warfare that we have today um, mm. so yeah I think you're right like yeah. another one from uh our good friend Wayne McAuliffe there is uh, has any I bet either of you have watched the new Mor Northman film? I haven't seen it. I, I told I, I, I says I says um, they still haven't brought that enough now. My wife wanted to watch that the first day it came out because of 
they all have historical clothing and myself and Michael actually know some of the people that worked on that movie and provided yeah. clothing for that movie. Um, so I wanted to watch it day one and my wife wanted to watch it just out of the principle that they used all historical clothing in that movie. And sadly, mm. it's not out in Japan yet. And my uh, wife, no, my wife that. wanted to watch it because Skarsgård's in it, and he looks like he takes his top off. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, I haven't <laughs> seen it. Yet, <laughs> I haven't seen it. Unfortunately. I've seen trailers yeah. for it, and um, I've just seen a, a bit, a few bits of trailers, and I have to say, it looks a big improvement on Vikings. Mm. But then again, what isn't? Uh, it's certainly better than the Thor movies, but then. You know, let's face it, a Bugs Bunny cartoon, um, you know, would be better than the Thor movies. Uh, when I see those, you know, B Frost has become a, a runway with flashing lights down it. No, yeah, it is. But it certainly it looks, um, from the clothing point of view, and that it looked a great deal better than certainly Vikings. And I believe, um, I believe the, that guy, uh, Scott God, um, is rather keen on having things accurate in his movies. Apparently, yeah. he's quite known for this. So he had some input uh, into that well, so i'll certainly be interested to see if there's any if there's any genuine you know uh, what the clothing is like because i mean if you take say the viking show hmm. there is nothing that's just scandinavian in it it is vaguely medieval it could be france it could be italy at any time in the middle ages for example you will you don't see any of the women say wearing what would have been typical dress for a reasonably well-off woman, which is the long underdress, the shorter overdress, the two brooches and that. Nobody had this. Um, the men's clothing, I mean, a lot of the, the people in the Scandinavian countries will have brilliant red or blue tunics, fur edge, this kind. Nobody had that. They're all going around in what looks, it looked more like the Sons of Anarchy because they're all in sort of biker leather. Um, mm. So from the costume point of view, it would have to be better. Even The Last Kingdom, I think, was better than Vikings. Uh, it wasn't perfect, but it was a little yeah, bit. A little bit. Have you, have you seen the last season of The Last Kingdoms? Uh, I, I'm about halfway through it. Uh, I'm about halfway through I, it. I don't want to spoil it, so... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I must say, they, they got, like, um, like, say, Winchester and that. They did a good job of uh, recreating the towns with mm. the dirty streets and all that. They did a very good job on, on that. But, um, yeah, Vikings, I must say, I really, the, the costumes really annoy me because they're so wrong. And you have this, even nobody has a helmet. Not that many uh, Viking raiders would have actually worn helmets. Or everybody, I mean, all the Saxons that are going around in helmets, none of the Norse yeah. people are wearing helmets. You know, uh, and the seer, now the seer, oh, the seer. I mean, for one thing, he's a man. He wouldn't have had the respect that, they, that he gets because it was mainly women but I mean there's nothing anywhere that says the seer had to look like they just dug him up in the valley of the kings because he looked like an animated Egyptian mummy and um, I actually I, I found I found him just so irritating but would you believe I actually worked with that guy John <laughs> Kavanagh really? I, I worked with him in the Abbey Theatre yeah he was wow. the young Kobe in the plow and the stars yeah so I now I wouldn't have recognized him with all that on his face of course but yeah, yeah, I actually yeah. worked with him but uh, yeah, I, I found him so annoying, you know, because there's nothing, there's nothing that says the seer should look like an animated Egyptian mummy that's just got out of a glass case in the Cairo Museum. You know? <laughs> um, another question here is uh, more Viking wise. What is your opinion on Ragnar Lothbrok? Was he a Viking equivalent of King Arthur, or was he a real man who truly was just a badass oh. and bred some fearless sons? <laughs> oh, well, that's, we've touched that's, this that's subject an interesting before. One. We've touched this before, Philip and I. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, I well, I mean, uh, I, I think from, from like, what we what, what we can uh, say that it's much more likely he was a, a, an invented character or based on someone. Mm -hmm. Now we know the sons are real. I mean, we know that Ivar the Boneless, Bjorn Ironside, Halfdan, and Uber were historical characters. But I'm inclined to think that their their surname probably was Ragnarsson. Mm -hmm. uh, their father probably was a Ragnar, not the Ragnar, and they probably cashed in on a legend of their own time because he was probably already a sort of folk hero. Um, oh, yeah. I would be inclined to think that, that he he is a made up uh, character based on maybe like King Arthur is probably based on some Romano British. Uh, auxiliary legionary commander or something who was left over after the Romans went. So that would yeah. be my take on Ragnar because it doesn't seem any 
any real historical uh, evidence that he existed, you know. It's getting very, there's the debate that myself and Michael have been reading up on. That, what's that book called again that we recently got between ourselves, The Viking Market of Britain and Ireland, is it? Yeah, something like that. I was actually reading it today and I can't remember the title. Yeah, it's, it's been so long since I actually read the title. Well. <laughs> uh, I, need, I need to go over that for the video that's coming up for uh, this weekend, which is the trade relationship Ireland and Kiev has as part of the Silk Road. It just so happens yeah. that Kiev is massive, um, massively a part of the Algorand right now uh, because of the yes. Ukrainian war. Um, this video has nothing to do with the Ukrainian war. It's literally concentrated on the Silk Road and mm. um, how Dublin was able to go over, bring their trade from Denmark, from Denmark then over to Kiev and stuff. And mm. so um, with that, there's something that's very interesting. That book that myself and Michael are going through right now, um, if Michael's able to find it, post a link to it on Amazon. Um, we'll try to go with that. Yeah. <laughs> if anyone who's watching wants to pick up the book. But um, anyway, regardless, um, right now it's trying to go back over um, what happened with the arrival of Ivor the Bonus. And it's, it ends up putting more questions that, in your head than it does answer. And mm. if you've read Claire Down from his previous book, and then the book that came uh, the following year from another author, um, Claire Downman's book being The Viking Kings of Britain and Ireland, and then the follow-up book is Norse Gaelic Context in the Viking World. It would have you believe that Ivor the Bonus and Olaf the White and that whole tree line of families originate from Norway. But this book takes a step back and says, aha, but when Ivor the Bonus comes in, it's then at that point that you see Danish mercenaries come in, pop in with the literature, which is very true, you're going through the annals, and then it's mm. like Danish mercenary, Danish mercenary, Danish mercenary. You even see Danish mercenaries popping up in Cork with the um, Gaul Gael, the Irish Viking, um, mm. Otter, Otter the Black, who comes in with Danish Vikings to take back Cork away from the Orn Octa, the um, Cashel. Cashel recently went over they took over and occupied Cork and kicked out Otter the Black. So Otter the Black mm. goes over to Britain for a few years. He then takes on Danish mercenaries. My main point is, is that's the point where Danish mercenaries suddenly appear. So you yeah. can turn around and say, oh, it looks like um, I've the bonus is related to um, all of the white and the whole Norwegian um, mm. Tree line, but why is it that the, uh, once I have the bonus pops up in 850 around 850? Uh, someone else will probably correct me on that date now. But it's at that point that Danish mercenaries come in with literature. At the same time, that's when we start to find uh, Danish finds in both Britain and the whole um, Hiberno Scandinavian trade link. That's where Danish finds start to pop up, and that's it, it, that's why we call it Hiberno Scandinavian now. We don't call it. Um, what was it? High North scale North, anymore. Yeah, North because scale. North scale just implied um, the relationship between Norway and Ireland. What we do find is when Ivor the Bonus comes in, it's then we're finding Scandinavian finds from all over the Scandinavian world. Not just mm. Norway and Denmark, but also from Sweden and Poland and various other areas that are now occupied by the Vikings as they advance all the way down to the Eastern Roman Empire with Kiev. Mm. Um, and so, when reading through this, and Michael will agree with me, it's really exciting right now because we're finding, we're going over the literature and we're really questioning what's going on. At the same time, we're digging into the ground and we're finding more and more stuff. Um, mm. Sometimes uh, we hit real gold um, because there's two annals that are missing right now. Uh, the two annals that are missing is Brian Brew's saga and also the Dublin saga. Um, so, imagine. We're digging through the earth and we find these two books that give us a solid answer mm. very very super super slim um that we do find it but you can imagine getting into well, archaeology and, oh, like, yes. well, well yes. we might we might find it if the you know if the uh dale ernan stopped building car parks over you know viking burial grinds or you know anything like that so <laughs> um but well okay. that, that could happen i mean look how they found richard the third yeah you know oh, yeah. Like in the car park you know but so yeah something like that could happen here um yeah. this book does touch on the on the theory that yeah um 
either the boneless was Norwegian or he that they also believe is Norwegian, but from a really heavily influenced Danish area. So it was within the sphere yeah. of Danish influence and trade. Um, if anything, it would have more ties towards Denmark than the rest of Norway. So um, because obviously you have to imagine how Norway is at the time. It's very... It's, it's mountainous right through the spine of it, you know, uh, you've got the coast and then the mountainous regions and then the rest of Norway. So a lot of places are very disconnected. We look at, when you look at maps today and you think, oh, it's just like a 10 minute drive to here and it's just over this hill. Back in them days, that, that could be a couple of miles down the road could be treacherous, you know, wildlife, bad weather. Yes, yes. Split your, that, that, you know. That's true. If somewhere like Norway, even even if there was, uh, even if it was only a couple of miles over a mountain or that, mm -hmm. without roads and that, you might even have been better off to get in your ship and travel around and, well, and go this, around the other side. This is it actually would have been easier. this is actually where the whole theory of why Viking ships became so like uh, prevalent in their society and why it became so important is because and it, and why they were so the same way in Ireland, the, where the rivers were the highways. The, you look at the Hebrides and the islands were all trade routes, all through the silver trade routes there. Uh, uh, this author calls them silver nodes, and they were all about markets and stuff. But I digress. Basically, these boats were the way to get around, safer, quicker, mm. you know, just all round far better way of traveling than going on foot or horseback around some of those parts of the mm. country. Yeah, and, uh, and of course, with their, with their draft requirement of only three feet, um, you could get a huge distance inland uh, yeah, in a very yeah. shallow river. I mean, the, when you think the river only had to be, you know, here yeah. and up, up you would go. And I, I'm sure there must have been many coastal towns in places like Ireland or France and that would think, ah, we're fine here. I mean, you're not going to get a warship up that little bit of a river. <laughs> but of course, the North ships could yeah. uh, do that. Um, and the same with the trade between the Baltic and Constantinople. Yeah. And they were able to navigate often tiny little rivers to get to this river and port the ship over into that one, which would have not have been possible if they had had a ship requiring a big draft. Mm -hmm. You know, it was it was a brilliant a brilliant design. And when you think of it, like Norse ships, they didn't actually go through the water; they more or less were on it. Mm -hmm. Rather, even when you see some of the uh, reproduction ships now, unlike uh, the average ship where it's down in the water, you see these vessels are literally just going along on, on top of the waves so a brilliant I, brilliant design yeah i've seen endless amount of um, irish historians get quite literally very bogged down by the <laughs> way people travel in ireland they're very much like people look at it Ar ireland at a very 2d dimension as in this is a road so they must have traveled from a to b but that road is very damaged so that it's just proof that these people were very backwards trade was very difficult to get from a to b in fact if they just took a step back because what they're looking from is more later medieval sources mm. um in particular where i'm from in mallow um with the desmond fitzgeralds the desmond fitzgeralds are given money to build a bridge and to repair all the roads and he writes letters to the king saying, oh yeah, the road is damaged again. And he never uses any of this money, pockets all the money. <laughs> but technically, oh, yeah. if you go back to the early medieval period, where I'm from in Malo, you can actually see the Black River going from Kildare, up from, yeah, it's Kildare, up around to where um, another area, another junction is, and then up into Malo. And from the Viking period, well, even I, I'd even go back all the way to the uh, Golden Age of Ireland, probably even further back still. Um, you could see trade coming in from France, coming in from Bristol, coming mm. in from various areas from the early medieval period, going up till there, right, cocking up and around, and then going off into Malta. And it's way faster. It, it, like the main way people were getting around in Ireland was to jump onto a river and then just take a boat around. And then, of course, when the Viking ships come in and the Irish adapt to the new Viking ships, trade yeah. goes far quicker. And so Desmond Fitzgerald, when we go into the later medieval period, he's writing letters to the King of England going, oh, the, da the roads are so damaged. Wouldn't it be great if we had roads just like in England? And so he yeah. gets all this money. And instead of... Um, investing it into roads and bridges he's already made why, why would he do that that would slow it down because the using the river from kildare up to mallow is far quicker you literally get on oh, the yeah. boat zip up and that's you why would you put it on a horse and carriage 
and then send it up the road. That's far, it's way too slow and way yes, too dangerous. Yes, that, 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 that's very good. I mean, uh, if you've got, you got a cart and a horse, and you've got one of these little river barges, even today, and you have a race, well, the river barge is going to get there a damn sight quicker than your horse and cart. Uh, 100%. Yes. Mm. And you know, that, that, there's another thing I think, I think is a very important aspect of the, the Norse, well, the Viking race, we'll call them that, um, is this idea that everybody has that the Vikings hated Christianity because well, you see, they must have hated Christianity because they were always attacking monasteries and nunneries mm -hmm. and churches. Yeah, because, I mean, you know, a burglar today, he looks through the house and there's a Maserati out the front, there's a swimming pool in the back, and they have a helicopter as well. Oh, I'm going to break into that. He looks at the house, the windows are broken, the curtains are dirty, and there's a bike chained to the railings. I'm not going to break into that. There's nothing there. And I mean, the vast majority of the money of that time was in the hands of the church. You know, your, your bishops and archbishops usually were wealthier than the kings that they served. So the Vikings went to churches and monasteries and that because that's where the money was. They weren't going there because they hated Christianity, because like a lot of pagans, the Vikings didn't care what you worshipped. Once you didn't try to make them worship your gods, you could worship a turn upon the stick for all they cared. Uh, so this idea that these raids were because they were Christian, no. Um, I, I was maybe an analogy like, you know, if the Jews and the Muslims had had all the money in those days, the Viking raiders would have walked past the Christian church, they'd have raided the mosque and the synagogue yeah. because Which that's they what they were going to do, yeah. you know. They, 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 uh, they were like modern like birds. Our last video on the African Irish Vikings, it clearly shows that we had the lights of Ironside and did I just butcher that? Um, God, what's his name again? Uh, yeah. Ragnar's uh, son who goes into the Mediterranean. Uh, Bjorn, Bjorn Ironside. Bjorn Ironside. Bjorn Ironside, 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 yeah. uh, Bjorn Ironside going into the Mediterranean and raiding into Italy and various places mm. around there. And he brings back all that wealth. So we know that they were going into um, that whole Mediterranean area where we had uh, people practicing Islam, uh, various mm. Jews and stuff. And the Vikings were literally picking where the most, where the majority of wealth was and hitting that. Yes. And it's from that point onwards mm. that we can see them hitting Liberia, hitting them, hitting around North Africa and stuff. And it's also interesting that that starts to increase more and more as we go into 950, that there's more and more Viking raids around Liberia, which is today um, Spain and Portugal. Um, mm. So they were, they were attacking the play areas that had the most wealth and slaves oh, yes. that could bring back to Dublin. Yes. You know? yeah. it, it made yeah. sense, it made sense, you know, I mean like, uh, why, why would you raid the corner sweet shop to get the till when there's a bank next door? You know, I mean, this, yeah. this is their motivation. They went where the money was. And, yeah. you know, because when you think of it, their acceptance of Christianity, look in Ireland, the way almost immediately the North settlers began to intermarry with the Irish, they were converging to, by the time of the Battle of Contarp, I mean, we, we are always told Brian Baru wanted to drive the pagans from Ireland. He'd have had a job to find one in Diffin in 1015, because most of them were Christian. The King of Diffin was Christian. I mean, he founded Christ Church Cathedral. Um, Brian just wanted the Kingdom of Diffin for himself. Uh, but the, the Norse were so quick to accept other people's religions and, they, and not to persecute them. I mean, the, the Danish and the Norwegian that settlers in Ireland didn't start going around killing all the Christians. They were living quite happily with the Christians quite often. I mean, look at the, look at the monastery in Cork. Whereas the, the, the uh, Scandinavian settlement and the monastery were side by side and the monks they were, were trading. Were, yeah. you know. So the, they did the not have, oh, you're a Christian, yeah. I'm going to uh, kill you kind of thing. Um, yeah. They weren't like even some of the caliphates from that later who, well, you you either convert to us or you're dead. They, they didn't have that. Because, uh, of course, when you think of it, pagans never had missionaries. They never mm -hmm. tried to convert people. They didn't care. Um, so the idea that they hated Christianity is, they might have hated individual Christians, especially if Christians had done something to them, like the St. Bryce's Day Massacre kind of thing. Um, though most of the Danes in that, that were massacred in that were probably already Christians anyway. Yeah, they were. But, um, you know, it, uh, yeah, that, that's another one of the fallacies, I think. Well, it ranks to the horned helmet, you know. Uh, it, it's, it's a popular idea, but it, it, it didn't happen. Well, we've okay. got another. We've got another one here. Um, I'm going to start. Okay. I'm going to ask question, and I'm going to start my sort of two pence on it, and then I'll let you fight it out after that. 
Um, no, carry on, carry on. So it says, uh, so who do you think would win uh, the, he um, the Great Heathen Army um, or a few uh, legions of, a, of an equivalent size? So I'm going to chip in here and say that I'm guessing when you say legion, you mean when everyone sort of envisions the region with the Lord Lorca segmentata, you know, the layered sort of uh, sheet metal that you see. I'm guessing that's what you mean. Now, actually, this has been sort of talked, actually talked about on previous blogs and stuff like that. And I think there's a number of things that you have to think about whenever you're thinking about this. Is that, one, we're not entirely 100% sure on the tactics and the style of fighting that the Vikings used. Not as the way we are with the Romans, because they wrote a lot down and we've got a lot of formations and stuff like that. So you're you're comparing one with a lot of information with a lot less information another thing is although cool that armor looks it wasn't as strong as, as you would think later medieval armor compared to that just wipes the floor with it and that's even as far as what we class as the dark ages it, that's a misnomer it wasn't really there was where it went down in other areas it went up in others creation of weapons weapons were stronger armor was stronger in a lot of places as well so you, you know you've got these slightly stronger weapons against slightly weaker armor stuff like that i was going to play a huge part so it, it's it's kind of i would say that the romans would win in my personal opinion mm. uh and that's mm. purely based on the fact that no no it, it's purely based on the fact that they are there's a bit famous line whether it's real or not i don't know where leonardus leonidas turns around to your his athens ally and he goes, what does your man do? And he goes, I'm a carpenter. And he goes, what does your man do? And he basically turns around in the filth here and goes, see my old friend, I brought more soldiers than you did. And that's the difference. Roman army was soldiers. Vikings weren't all soldiers. They could be, like, yeah, like Denton's already yeah. touched on the anybody. subject. Yeah, anybody. And they're not all trained the same standard. So I am going, and no matter, so I'm going to say yeah. the professional always beats the uh I, I would I, I would be inclined I would be inclined to agree with you. I mean when you look at the Boadicea uh, rebellion, when Suetonius Paulinus finally uh, confronted her, she outnumbered him many times over. Mm. But his men were disciplined, they held a line, uh, hers all rushed in a rabble, they jammed up against the Roman shield wall, they had long swords, they couldn't swing them because they were you know, whereas the Romans just kept stabbing away. Yeah. And a much smaller Roman force won because of their discipline, their organization, and the fact that the other lot weren't soldiers. Mm. They were just a rabble. Um, so yes, a very disciplined for small force usually will overcome a, a larger uh, a larger force. And well, as you say, most of the, the Viking raiders, few of them were actual soldiers, if you like. The, I mean, the house cows and that of the kings and jarls, yeah, they were professionals and a small group of raiders who did nothing but raid yes but the, i mean probably 80 percent at least of your raiders were farmers fishermen carpenters okay the weather's nice we'll go on a raid then i'll come back and finish building that house you know these were not really these were not going to have the fighting ability of well say the the, the norse people who became the varangian guard they would have been a very different uh, no. matter because these were highly trained soldiers i mean the varangian guard would probably have slaughtered the average uh, the Viking raiding party mm. because they were far far superior in, in equipment and and don't forget most most of the Viking raiders were not have worn armor mm. few of them would have had chain mail or helmets they were expensive so your average Viking raider was going to be in a, a jerkin a tunic uh, the only way he's going to get a helmet or chain mail is if he takes one off somebody who's dead um, mm. so you, you, even even a small only small number of them would have had anything like this or chainmail um so they would have been at a great disadvantage against heavily armored uh even say the, the slightly later say heavy cavalry of the normans mm. in their mm. armor and that would have probably plowed out a shield wall because they would have just been too strong for it so i, I would say your, your i would say your assessment is pretty is pretty good uh, the the uh, sometimes of course a professional body i mean is a malana in mm. the zulu war where the Zulus swept over the British because they had not deployed very well. You can sometimes have a rabble that beats a professional army, but usually only when the professional army makes a mistake. As in that case, Colonel Pauline had 
put his men out into redoubts instead of proper firing lines. Later, the Battle of Alundi, where the British troops were all in rows, firing lines, sort of kneeling, standing, you know, the Zulus got nowhere because the, the superior British forces were, were properly deployed. At this time, Milana, they weren't. So I, I think your argument uh, holds up in, in, in military terms, certainly. That's well, my two cents. <laughs> My, my, my 20 cents on that <laughs> is that it depends on um, which view you're going from. If most likely you are thinking about a big open field and you're thinking about the default Viking, who mm. basically is a normal, regular uh, free man who comes mm. from a basic small little village, he's got an axe and he's got a, and not even a professional axe, an axe that's made for one yeah. button. And there is there any old shield, yeah. Yeah. and he doesn't even have time to train in martial arts 24 7 compared to his other counterparts in mm. both Ireland, Scotland, and Scandinavia. And furthermore, he's then going up against a fully disciplined Roman soldier, uh, even if it's not even in my field of expertise, which uh, Roman history isn't. It, mm. It's quite obvious that straight away this poor Viking is going to get ploughed down. However, mm. as Denton has pointed out, um, if you're talking about Viking from a wider scale and you're thinking about Roman history from a wider scale, mm. um, we do actually have examples of um, people of the Scandinavian world fighting Romans um, in mm. the late antiquity period uh, in Eastern Roman Empire. Uh, we do actually have the likes of the Rus of Novgorod and of mm. Kiev going down and actually mm. hammering um, the Byzantine Empire, uh, the Eastern yes. Roman Empire, and even going into Constantinople and sacking Constantinople. Yes, um, that, that's, we, that's, a, that's a good example. But of course, the yeah. only thing to remember there is the Romans they were dealing with, especially the East. I mean, these were not the Romans that would have been following Julius Caesar or Pompey. They were yeah. very yeah. different lot. There are, uh, well, I mean, the, the great disaster in the Teutoburg Forest, the Roman legions would probably have slaughtered the Germanic tribe in a field, but when they marched through a forest and they're attacked from both, they couldn't uh, deploy. Not just, so, no, 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 no. Uh, not just that, they were taught, you remember, they were led by a Roman as well. They weren't they were, yes. They were so not, they were taught, they, they, they were taught all the plans that the Romans would deploy they had deployments for being flanked. They had deployments for being, yes, you yes. know, all these. They, they, they were to a, a yeah, place where they well, but, So this is the thing. I think, yeah, but I, uh, Luke sort of established the boundaries of the argument. If you go into varying mm. different uh, parts of his argument, like Varingian guards and you know different time mm. periods in the Roman era, because we know it waxed and waned in its wealth when it skimped on. Uh, the armor and stuff like that so it's it's very hard to you know you're and you're comparing a thousand years of roman history basically and, and yes yes 500 years of viking history uh, at two different ends of of history so yeah I, uh, with your in your argument of julius caesar's octavian's legions against sort of um, the at, at the time of the great heathen army um i would say the romans would sort of have mm. no problem. But there is one thing. There is one thing, though, where the like of Viking raiders or the Gauls or any of those would have been have more of an advantage. Would be fighting in a town where the opponents, be they Romans or Macedonian phalanx or whoever, could not deploy in their formation, and it would have been individual, me against you. That would have been. That would have come down to individual ability more. Mm. Um, uh, so, like, a, a fight in a town or in a village or even in a forest would be a very different thing from wide open countryside and everybody all lined up in proper formation because most of the professional armies of those days, the Romans, the Greeks, they liked to have a lovely big open space. Everybody, there's your, your unit there and your unit there and the cavalry is here. They did not like fighting in a town where you could walk around the corner and meet the enemy. So in a, in a context like that, the, the Norse raiders might have had an advantage. Um, it, they would have been let better able to deal with an enemy that was broken up and, and disorganized rather than the, in proper formation. You know, so um, I, I think in their day they could have had an advantage. Another question we got here um, is, uh, what do you think about Berserkers and Ulf Hednar, were they in Ireland? 
win. I got you sorted. I literally seen that. I was actually preparing that. Yeah. Um, the Fenian and the Finn. Uh, and it's the Fenian cycle. Um, the Fenian cycle, the Irish and Scots Gaelic literature. Um, actually, I'll send you the link there, Wayne. I'll type it out when I'm ch- walking on my way to you. Um, yeah, we actually have um, sources where we have Irish uh, Finn war bands that go in the, the Fenian. They live in the countryside. Um, they're taught at a very young age to uh, the basic skills and drills of what it is to be a warrior. They go out into the countryside. They live there from the age of 14. Once they have finished their finished their fosterage, the fosterage being when um, as part of a, an alliance between two clans, they would give their son over to another clan, and they, that other clan then would educate their son from the age of 7 to 14. Once they had completed their basic training uh, from a Fenian point of view, they would have gone into a war band, right? From there, they would have gone into the boundaries of a Tuit, which is like for Munster, it would have been up around, um, what? It would have been between the boundaries of anyway, of Leinster. Uh, Mead and Connacht, so up around that whole area, and they would have gone around that whole boundary area, and they would have bumped into another war bands, and they would have had skirmishes. And this is all about part of the ba- banter, anyway. If you actually read this book, the Finn Cycle, the Irish and the Scots of Gaelic Literature, it it makes it out that it was all a good laugh, although sometimes it escalates to a point where a young fella gets killed, and then they take mm. his head, they put his head into a bag, and then they go into the forest. Uh, the forestry and they actually live in the forestry uh, for most of the winter and the summer sometimes they go into specific settlements that are made for them where there is brothels uh, where women give them company and the women end up making a fortune there's um, if you read through it there's women that go off and open up their own brothels <laughs> um, that are catered just for these specific boys boys going into men because this is between the age of 14 to 25 and then they were looked after by uh, basically, I don't know if Facebook's going to cut this bit out, but uh, bastard children, the unwanted children of nobles would raise up these Fenians and they were the head of these Fenian war bands. And in this, one of the skills and drills that they're taught is how to put animal skin on and basically camouflage themselves, put dirt on their face and stuff. Mm. Just like we see with the berserkers and stuff in their literature where they put animal skin on and they can camouflage themselves and then they take drugs and so on and so forth to escalate themselves to go into battle. And we can see that in the Tawn, Ku Cullum. Um, and I know it's in the mythology part, but there's so much in the Tawn that, um, because the Tawn itself was written for these young fellas um, mm. as part of a story. And myself and Michael, who've done military service, we like our stories to have realism in it. And mm. if you go through the Tawn, there is endless amount of stuff in the Tawn uh, we know the Tawn was written during the Viking Age because the skills and drills that are seen in the Tawn, we can see um, various war bands in Ireland use them. Um, mm. So, what we can gather in that is that there's a moment where in that, um, Kukulam goes into a rage and he, go, he, he can't be calmed down. It's not until he's put into a uh, bash full of naked women and they're putting cold water into him that he comes out of this berserk state. So yeah, that might it help, is yeah. very likely that we did have um, berserkers in Ireland. And hmm. even to step it up a wee bit, if we go back into um, ancient literature, we can see, um, what was it, um, Gaul, is it Gaul? France? Gaul? Gaul, Gaul. Yeah, Gaul. Yeah. 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 Uh, we can see uh, various clans coming from Gaul, if that's the correct, uh, correct word, because yeah. ancient history now is out of my field. But we can see groups coming out of Gaul to go and sack Rome in around, I think it's 390. I'm sure it's 390 they come down to sack Rome. Oh, they do several yeah, times. Well, Towards yeah, the end, yeah, yeah, they do yeah. several times, to be fair, uh, right through its mm. history. Yeah. Yeah. It was always their biggest sure. fear, you know, that was what they did to galvanise mm. their... And in the we can see men who actually just remove their clothing, go completely naked, and just have a shield and sword, and then go into the uh, line, the peasants, I can't remember what they're called in Rome, but they go into that line, they freak out, and they run off the field. And it makes sense, if you're using, if you're using shield wall and shield wall tactics, you need a way to break part of that shield wall. So it makes yes. sense that some fellas 
would literally run at the shield to try to dislodge it. So that way they can open a gap for other lands to go yes. and open up the entire yes. line. Well, so yes. for me, berserkers make perfect sense from a tactical point of view. It, it makes perfect sense. Because, um, yeah. I mean, they did have a... Well, they did have a wedge formation, they which did. would yeah, drive yeah, at the field wall and try to crash through. And we know yeah. no drugs were used because, I mean, we found that there's a grave of a vulva and she had a container and it was full of henbane seeds, mm. which is a powerful hallucinogen. Um, so, like, we know that drugs, drugs were taken. And, I mean, um, the... The use of getting someone so worked up, so excited, or so in pain already uh, that they feel nothing. I mean, that's been used. As a matter of fact, the, the famous 1911 45 caliber Colt pistol, uh, the American one, was actually developed because of that, because the Americans were fighting the, um, what was it, the Moro tribesmen over in the, the Philippines. Yeah. And the Moro had a very interesting thing, but the men would basically bind their kind of, um, you know, bits down below, the sort of spherical ones. They would fight, bind these till they were in agony. They were in so much pain that if you shot them somewhere that wasn't vital, they didn't even feel it. They just kept going. If you didn't hit them in the heart or the brain, they came at you, so the Americans needed a bigger gun. But these would have been very like the berserkers. Now, they'd gone wild for a different reason because they were in pain, but the result would be the same. They would just keep coming. Um, so, yes, it does seem uh, very logical that the ber berserkers existed. And if it was a thing that was done by the Scandinavians generally, I would assume it would have been done in Ireland, in Britain, in anywhere they were. You know, I, I can't see them just doing it in Scandinavia. Um, you know, one would assume they would have uh, been doing it here. We're at the hour mark. Sorry. We're at the hour mark. One hour. Oh, uh -huh. okay. <laughs> Do we get a prize or something for that? No. <laughs> we're just, we're just... I think we'll have for another 15 minutes. But, uh... <laughs> but, well, this can, be, yeah. this can always be a part two. We can always make a part two, see what people think. Yeah, yeah. Can, that's get, true, get, get part more, two. Uh, whiskey and I can chat away for all night. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's true. I mean, a discussion, like this, well. uh, a discussion like this could still be going on at 6 o'clock in the morning kind of thing, you know. And, uh, uh, yes, part two, that, sound, that sounds good. But, well, um, yeah. I mean, I think, I think we've covered a good few things. Already. Yeah, there's been a good few things. Thanks very much for the questions here um, and the views. You know, only towards the end there did it start to. It never dropped below four or five. So, and we were we went all the way up to nine views, which is I think great to keep. We managed to keep people entertained for that long. Um, well, I think I think we did well. And don't forget <laughs> when we the original advert was for. A different uh, was for YouTube, yes, not yeah. Facebook. So well, the fact that we got that many on, uh, you know, I, I think it is yeah. quite good. So, other people might have just gone to look at you, uh, YouTube or don't see it and yeah. didn't bother. You know? So we will. Um, we now realise what was wrong with our YouTube. Um, you have to apply for a live thing first time, twenty four hours in advance. Mm -hmm. So when we applied for to go live, we thought we'd just go straight away live because we've met all the other yeah. criteria. But actually, they need a full day to do whatever they need to do. Yeah. So we've already done that. So next time, this will be recorded and live on one of the channels, uh, one of the three yeah. channels. Um, we'll also get past, you know, I, I think I know how to work this recording system now after trial and error. Um, and uh, so, but yeah, thanks very much for joining us. Uh, we and Luke, you know, uh, thanks so much for the, the comments in there. And uh you know, all he is was a was a good 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 hour, good hour of information, a lot of information to digest. So, um, yes, I thought I, I thought so. It, it it went well. There were a lot of interesting topics, and then and some sensible questions. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, because you can sometimes get questions, and you say, "How dumb are you? You even <laughs> ask that?" Oh, you know, and no, nobody did that. So that's that's good. Well, that's good because uh, well, there are well, a lot of things on top. If everyone wants to see. Go on, I was going to say, should we just uh, say goodbye to everyone and then we'll we'll continue chatting. Oh yeah, continue to chat. <laughs> <laughs> right, take care now, guys. Yes. Take care now. Bye bye. Absolutely, absolutely. absolutely. Goodbye, best. goodbye. Oh, subscribe to Irish Medieval. Yes, yes. Ah, yes. Oh, absolutely, and Denton's yes. histories as well. well. I'll put links up and, 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 and Denton's tales as well. Don't you? You need to leave me out there. I've no, I said it wrong. Right. I said it wrong. Right. <laughs> goodbye. Goodbye. And one more thing, myself and my Niacal are live on the 15th of May 
All times are seen right in front of you right now. Ireland's 10 a.m., Boston 5 a.m., California 2 a.m., so you guys will be staying up late if you want to watch that one, and also in Australia at 7 p.m. Uh, this will be on YouTube this time, and we're basically live streaming Crusader Kings 3, which is set in 11th century Ireland, and we're going to be talking about the history of it. And any questions you guys have on 11th century Ireland, make sure to make a note of it, and we'll have a discussion about it on the 15th of May. So, yeah, that's it really. Um, as always, guys, thanks very much and all the best. Oh, and also check out the merchandise.